Welcome back DPV TV viewers. It is Chris Nichols here. We've got another buyer's guide for you. Today though, we're focusing on landscape photography. And speaking of beautiful landscapes, look at that bridge construction behind me. Just gorgeous. I wish I had a camera to shoot it. That's why we're gonna do this guide. Now we've done a couple buyer's guides already. We did street and we did wildlife photography, now landscape. And so as usual with those guides, we're sticking to three price points, under $1,000 USD, under $3,000 USD, and then sky's the limit, money's no object. And we're always going by retail current pricing as of the release of this video. Now I know we don't really talk about lenses in these videos, but rest assured, we do actually factor in lens choice into our picks. And you know, for landscapes, first off, I wanna say it's not just wide angle realms. I mean, sometimes telephotos can take beautiful landscapes and normal ranges, but having a good selection of wide and ultra wide lenses is important. So that does give extra weight to our choices. All right, so let's get started with cameras under $1,000. And actually the first cameras that come to mind are entry level SLRs, Canon EOS Rebel T8i, Pentax KF. I mean, you got lots of benefits here, regardless which way you go. Usually pretty good choices for lenses. Uh, you know, you've got large APS-C size sensors, good image quality, good battery life. The only real issue I have with SLRs, and again, we've been shooting landscapes for decades with them, is just it's nice to have the live view that mirrorless cameras offer so you can preview what your exposure is gonna look like. Now I know you guys might be saying, hey Chris, hang on, hang on. We do have live view preview on SLRs, and that's true. But what if you've got direct sunlight on the back of your screen? That can make it really hard to see, whereas with a mirrorless camera, I could go to the EVF and get the same experience. But it's still a really affordable and excellent choice if you're looking for landscape to go with an SLR. Okay, so let's say we want that mirrorless advantage of having the live view preview. Well, then let's look at cameras like, well, Canon and Nikon. I mean, they make nice bodies. The problem is they just don't have the ultra wide and wide angle lens support. There's just not a lot of great options. So that really keeps us from recommending them. Now, Fujifilm does actually have tons of lenses. In the ultra wide, they do have an expensive 10 to 24. They've got, you know, a couple other choices. There is some third party support and you could absolutely get a plethora of Fujifilm cameras like the X-C4, uh, the X-T30. These would all be good choices, but Lens choice is key, and so that's why we're gonna go with the Sony A6100 as our you know, runner up for best landscape camera here under $1,000. It's a good price point, it's easy to carry around, you've got lots of lenses, and although autofocus maybe isn't that big a consideration for specifically landscape, you're not just gonna shoot landscapes, and in that case, the real-time tracking of the Sony A6100 is fantastic. So our winner for best landscape camera under $1,000 is the Panasonic G9. I mean, it's just got so much going for it. The price has dropped huge, putting it at an affordable price point. You get a rugged body with an excellent LCD panel and EVF. It's fast shooting. It's got lots of great features. I do like the fact that we have IBIS, that in-body image stabilization, so you get a lot of handheld shooting opportunities. And I know you're saying, okay, well, micro four-third sensors, blah, blah, blah. It's not as good as anything else, yada, yada, yada. The fact is, they take great photos. And even more importantly, the Panasonic G9 has an excellent multi-shot high-res mode. Now, this, yes, only works on photos where you're stationary, but last time I checked, landscapes move very slowly. I mean, it's minor amounts, over hundreds of thousands of years. I think you'll be okay. The G9 does have motion compensation there, though, so that if there's anything moving in the frame, it'll take care of that. And I love that it does the multi-shot high-res mode in camera, so now you're getting 80 megapixel shots. They have better dynamic range than just the single shot. So you have the advantage of what a larger sensor would also give you. And you also get all of this in one easy to edit raw file. Convenient, everything set for you. It's easily our winner. All right, so now let's talk about cameras under $3,000, starting with our honorable mentions. While we're on the topic of Micro Four Thirds and the Panasonic G9, now that we have a bit of a higher budget, we now get into the OM system, OM5 and OM1. These cameras have a similar 20 megapixel sensor Micro Four Thirds, but now we're getting the benefits of computational photography. We get great features like Live ND. We get that multi-shot high-res mode, but now in a handheld option, so you don't need to even use a tripod to do it. And we also get other benefits like uh, having things like starry autofocus if you want to do nighttime photography. I mean, there's lots of advantages here. Now, the OM5 does have a lot of what the OM1 has at a much more affordable price point, but the OM1 does give you faster autofocus focusing, better subject detection modes, and it also does have an enhanced live ND mode that gets you uh, just, you know, slower shutter speeds when you really want to blur that water. Regardless, the advantage here is you often don't have to bring a tripod. I don't know if it'd be my choice for overall landscape, but if I was doing travel photography, urban landscapes, and just, you know, wanting to go out into the woods and not carry a whole bunch of gear, these are basically unbeatable. 
Now our next camera is such good value for the dollar, it's roughly around the halfway mark of our $3,000 price point. That's the Nikon Z5. I mean, you're getting a very nice body as far as ergonomics go. IBIS, that image stabilization in the body with any lens you put on there, and an excellent full frame sensor and all the image quality that, that entails. And the things you're giving up going up to the Z6 series, you know, faster autofocusing, more processing power, just aren't that big a deal when it comes to specific landscape photography. And that money that you save can now be spent on actually Nikon's excellent full frame wide angle lenses like their 14 to 24 or their 20 mil prime. These are good choices. And now you've saved the money on the body, you got the budget for them. But the Nikon Z5 is not a runner up because really when it comes to landscape, one advantage that you can get at this price point now is higher resolution, more megapixels, that ability to crop, that ability to print larger and just have more detail inherent in the file. And so that means we're gonna go up to something like the Sony a7 IV, which I really like as a camera overall, great focusing, a jack of all trades, but it does have nice resolution in its sensor with that 33 megapixel. But if you're looking purely for landscape and you want that higher resolution edge, the Sony a7R 3 is under budget and it gives us that excellent 42 megapixel full frame sensor. Maybe it's not as good an all around camera as the a7 IV, but it's still capable for other kinds of photography, but excellent dynamic range, great image quality. And no matter what Sony platform you decide to go with, you're always getting excellent original manufacturer lens choices, as well as tons of third party lens support and adapted glass and that really does give an edge to Sony. But our winner for best landscape camera under $3,000 and just barely is the Nikon Z7 II. I mean you get great ergonomics, it's fantastic handling body, in-body image stabilization and although the Z5 has a lot of the similar features, what it doesn't have is the Z7-2's excellent full frame 45 megapixel sensor. Now this not only gives you high resolution but actually excellent dynamic range as well, some of the best we've seen in full frame. It's got a native ISO of 64 and it does take advantage of that to give you just the ability to really boost shadows and handle as much range as possible between dark and light in your photographs. Something very important with landscape photography. So we got a nice featured camera with some of the best image quality. That's our winner. So now we're into money is no object territory. Let's get some of the weird cameras out of the way that I just wouldn't recommend at this infinite price point. I mean, first off, removable medium format digital back cameras like the Hasselblads, the Phase 1s, I just wouldn't do it. I want something rugged and compact and, you know, just better suited. But hey, money is no object. You guys go for it. Uh, cameras like the Hasselblad X2D, compact, great to travel with, great to go out in the mountains with, but when we have a live histogram, maybe then we'll talk. What about expensive flagship mirrorless cameras like the Sony A1 or the Nikon Z9? I mean, you could certainly absolutely use cameras like that, but you're paying a lot of money for features that just don't benefit landscape. And honestly, at more affordable price points, there's better image takers out there. So let's get to our serious choices. My runner up for best landscape camera, money's no object. It's gonna be a full frame camera, the Sony A7R5. When you look at the features and the specs, there's just nothing that can really touch it. I do like the body design. It's compact, easy to travel with, good battery life, decent controls. I like the fact that we're getting a 60 megapixel sensor in here with great dynamic range. And yes, you do have the more affordable A7R4, that's an option. But when money's no object, the A7R5 gives you a better EVF and that great articulation on the back panel, which is very useful for landscape photography. You also get a high res multi-shot mode that now has motion correction. But when your standard files are 60 megapixels with excellent dynamic range, I find that I don't often have to use the multi-shot feature. I'm also getting the excellent IBIS unit in the A7R5. Handheld stability is top notch. If you want to do handheld photography, even in low light situations without a tripod, you can often get away with it. And this camera has probably the best autofocus that you'll find in a full frame camera. So it opens up a lot of versatility. If you're shooting portraiture or sports, you know, stick to landscape. fine. Okay. Stick to landscape. It's an amazing landscape option, but as full frame cameras go, it's probably also the most versatile option, but it's not our winner. Let's get to that next. Best landscape camera, money's no object. It's a Fujifilm. I know you already guessed it. You know what's coming here. But first off, I just want to say we didn't talk about the X-T5 slash X-H2 when we were in our under $3,000 price point. Even though they have excellent 40 megapixel APS-C sensors, I just felt like the full frame cameras gave you better options for landscape. But there's no disputing that the Fujifilm GFX medium format cameras are the best option for landscape. And of course, our favorite choice, even though the GFX 100 is more expensive, it's a GFX 100S. What is not to love? You get that amazing 100 megapixel sensor 
clearly well suited for landscape photography. We also prefer the GFX 100S's body over the 100 because it is more compact. You get nice ergonomics. I like the fact that we've got that Fuji style tilt screen, certainly nice for landscape when you're at awkward angles and it's just easier to travel with. Fujifilm also have an excellent line of lenses, including the 20 to 35, which is very rare in medium format to have an ultra wide range like that. And it's also a very sharp lens. Now, do you get IBIS on a medium format body? Absolutely, it has it and it's very effective. Now, what if you're a landscape photographer that shot only Velvi and you're feeling nostalgic? Set it to Velvi mode, you'll get those almost purple skies, but with way more dynamic range than you ever had on slide film. And if you want to say, okay, 100 megapixels is plenty, but not enough for me. I need way more than that because you're a maniac, well then you can shoot their multi-shot mode and get 400 megapixels. Good luck with that. So that does it for our buyer's guide for best landscape camera at three different price points. Let us know in the comments below what buyer's guide you want to see next. Also, we can't cover all the cameras today, so let us know in the comments what you think is the best landscape camera. Any recommendations or whether you agree with our choices or disagree with our choices, especially if you agree with our choices. We like those. Like and subscribe to the channel. Check out our Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you soon with another episode of Beat Your TV. Thank you